Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Stavalian, um, uh, tech lead of the GoFest project. Uh, and here I'm going to be talking a bit about what we've uh, included in the 0 0.5 release. It's a massive release. It includes changes from almost a year of time. Uh, so a lot of new features, a lot of bug fixes. Uh, first up, uh, content routing. This was really the main focus of this release was to fix content routing um, and to like make it so you could really quickly resolve content because for a while there on AFS network, it was taking a while to actually find the content you're looking for. Uh, uh, the main part of this uh, feature for this endeavor was Cypress. This is the code name for our new DHT, uh, but you'll hear all about it in the next presentation, so I won't actually talk about it too much here. <laughs> um, but I can give you some metrics. Uh, this is uh, what it looked like when we switched over, or this is what the public uh, network metrics looked like when we switched over from uh, the previous GoFest release 0 0.4.23 to this release 0 0.5. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, in the, the first quadrant, uh, this is the uh, number of dials, that's the number of connections you have to form, um, that the green is the number of connections you have to form to do a query. Uh, and then on the right hand side, that's after the release, massively reduced the number of dials. If you look at the graph in the upper right hand quadrant, um, before uh, the green there is the um, uh, number of provides that like finished and actually succeeded. And the top is the number of uh, finds that succeeded. So the provides are the announcements like I have the content. The finds are the, like the query network trying to find the content. And then on the right, you can see that it basically went to 100% on both sides. On the bottom uh, left hand quadrant, um, you can see that again, pro or, um, uh, content writing like announcements were basically timing out. Uh, now, this will take a while. Um, uh, this will get a lot better as network upgrades, but they're actually finishing. Um, and finally, in the bottom right hand quadrant, you can see that before it was taking like, well, quite, quite a bit longer <laughs> to resolve content than on the right. Um, yeah. So again, CAPS here, these numbers are highly variable. Um, uh, it's very noisy data. Uh, these numbers also get a lot better as network upgrades. So like one of the reasons this is so tricky is we were not just making changes to the query logic that was like querying the network. We were making changes to like the other side of logic, the, the, the server side of logic to like make the entire network faster, but that means the network has to upgrade. Uh, finally, there are a lot more improvements on the way. So we're not just gonna wait for the network to upgrade. Um, we have a couple of tricks up our sleeves to like try to at least give you some like initial speed of bump uh, when you're starting the query. So you don't have to like deal with a slow network. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, content exchange. Uh, this is something we worked a lot on last year. Um, uh, we worked a lot on uh, like really improving bit swap and making it faster. Um, so uh, again, I'm not going to talk too much about this because there's going to be a presentation later on um, uh, or a demo. Uh, but basically, we uh, massively reduced the base of bandwidth if you do look at blocks. If you look at the bottom right hand <laughs> graph here, uh, basically that red line at the bottom, that's that's a new bit swap, and that's how many duplicate blocks there is in the test, zero. Uh, uh, and then um, if you look at the top uh, uh, graph, uh, you can see that like this, or the top line here is with um, like basically one person serving data, one person fetching data uh, in both the old version and the new version, same speed. But then as you go down, you can see this bottom red line, that's with four people serving data and one person fetching data. Um, you can see that that is much, much faster than uh, this well blue line here, which is in the old release. Um, yeah, so it's about 30% uh, faster, at least in this uh, graph. Yeah, so basically we just massively increase the parallelism and bit swap and reduce the book of blocks. Uh, next up, we actually have experimental support for something called GraphSync in this release. Uh, GraphSync is a, um, or it's experimental server-side support. GraphSync is a new exchange protocol um, where with BitSwap, if you want a piece of data, you have to go and ask for every single little piece from the network. With GraphSync, you just kind of like tell your peers a description of the subset of the data that you want, and they send you all the data at once. This is tricky uh, because like one, you need to be able to describe the subset. Two, you need to be able to like take up, they take a description of the subset, like break it into smaller descriptions. So you can like fetch one bit from someone and one bit from someone else. We haven't quite figured out that second part yet. Um, so for now, we do is like we allow other people to ask for data from you using GraphSync. So like someone goes a special purpose tool like this pull app, like pull a lot of data from you, but your IFS node will actually pull data from other peers using this protocol. However, we hope this will help with like pinning service and stuff like that. Like if they need to like pull a lot of data from uh, clients all at once and like they know exactly who they want to pull it from, they can write a custom tool that just like slurps up all the data really, really quickly and doesn't have a bunch of round trips or other overhead. Um, so that's graphsync. Uh, okay, moving on to import export. 
uh, import export is like how we add data to IPFS and get it out of IPFS. Uh, this release has two big features here. Uh, one, add performance. Uh, we have uh, a two to three, or sorry, in this release, we've uh, improved our like new experimental uh, data store by uh, two to three X. Uh, that's uh, this new experimental data store is called Badger. We didn't write Badger, but we are like, integrated into GoIPFS. Uh, this number here, uh, the, red, or the red bar, is how long it took to add the arc repo uh, before this release. Uh, the uh, yellow bar is how long it took after the release. You'll notice that the green bar is how long it takes to just copy and paste the arc repo on the same machine. So basically, we're like you can add data to as fast as you can just copy it uh, from like disk back to the disk. Uh, this blue bar here is how long it takes to flat FS. That's still unfortunately the default data store. It's the default data store for two reasons listed here. One, Badger. Uh, well, sometimes it's spiked to one gigabyte of memory usage. This is no issue. Uh, we're planning on fixing it, um, uh, but we still need to fix it, hopefully, with the next couple of releases. And ba in Badger GC, or garbage collection of like deleted data, basically, actually, we're claiming deleted spare space from deleted data. Uh, it doesn't always work as well as we'd hope. So we're trying to like improve that a bit before we say, OK, this is now the default. OK, the second big feature was um, import export of uh, DAGs. Uh, so the cool, like, what this feature is, like, it allows you to uh, give IPFS a CID. And then uh, instead of like, getting back a bunch of individual files, it, like, IPFS will just give you like, this, this special archive of all the little pieces of the file as IPFS sees it. So that means that when you re-import this data, you're always going to get the same CID back out. This means that you take like, any set of files or any data set you have an IPFS, it's sort of bundled up into this thing called the car file or content address archive, ship it off to another computer, um, and then re-import it, or like send it off to someone else and archive it or something like this. Um, uh, finally, down here, I have this line, uh, you can use this with netcat. So uh, if, if GraphSync isn't fast enough for you, but it's not fast enough for you, and you really just need to get data from one computer to the other, you can use DAG export to export on one computer, netcat it to a different computer, DAG import on the other computer, and it's going to be just about as fast as you can get it. Um, uh, yeah. Next up, libpdb changes. There were tons of libpdb changes in this release. Um, first up, improved AutoNet. AutoNet is our service for detecting if you have or uh, if you're behind a firewall. So that's like checking like to see if if you can receive inbound connections and which addresses you can receive inbound connections on. The main improvements of this release are faster AutoNet detection, a lot of rate limiting, a lot of dial back restrictions and filterings. Um, uh, we've added all this because we're actually enabling it by default. Now, every single node will use the network to determine, like, or to use AutoNet with the network to determine if they are publicly reachable. And they will also help other peers on the network determine if they are publicly reachable. But we don't want to overload by just like, asking them to do a bunch of work on behalf of the network. So we have to do a bunch of rate limiting. Um, next steps here, in 0 0.6, we're going to have even faster NAT detection, uh, basically just more event-based. So like, instead of like polling on some interval, like we see a new peer. And we see this speak auto now. You just ask them, hey, am I public or am I private? Uh, so that should bring the time down to a very, very short period of time. Um, uh, and then uh, deeper integration with uh, with P2P. Currently have a bit of an issue where like, we'll detect a bunch of external addresses um, and those advertises external addresses. We're not really sure which ones work, so which ones don't actually work. Um, if we can integrate AutoNet and um, uh, like this other part of P2P like tightly, um, uh, then we can reduce the number of addresses we advertise, which will actually speed up a lot of operations in the network. Because it means that instead of like trying to connect to a bunch of addresses where like some of them may work and some of them might not work, you're only going to try the address that will work. Okay, next up, we switch to TLS by default. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, TLS is a transport security layer or uh, transport layer security protocol. Um, uh, it is a, uh, yeah, it's basically just, it's a protocol for encrypting connections. Uh, currently, we're using uh, a protocol called SecIO, but TLS is much well or much better understood. Um, and it's been actually, I think, proven at this point. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, it, it just has better security properties. Um, uh, it's faster, actually, uh, use a lot of CPU. Um, yeah, next up, we're also going to be introducing another secure transport called Noise uh, for uh, bit and drop with uh, JavaScript and languages. Noise is a lot simpler to implement than TLS, um, uh, although I don't believe it's quite as well as well understood as TLS, because TLS is the protocol that secures the entire web. Uh, uh, and then we will be deprecating our current um, uh, security transport called SecIO in the near future uh, so that we can use these like well-tested, well-understood security transports. Okay, 
uh, Quick Draft 27. Uh, uh, we've updated the Quick Protocol version in this release. This should be the final update to the Quick Protocol version uh, before we actually mark it stable and just like keep using that same Quick Protocol version. Um, uh, so expect to see Quick Sport by default in 0.6. Uh, this has been a long time in the making. Um, for those of you who don't know what this is, Quick is a, a UDP-based transport um, rather than TCP-based. Uh, that probably doesn't mean a lot to many of you, uh, but basically what this means is uh, effectively you can just keep more connections open. You can, or you can, you can talk to more peers at once, um, and there's less overhead. Basically, let's make things faster. Uh, finally, um, uh, we've switched the uh, address format. I bring this up here because it'll confuse people who don't understand what's happening here. Um, before you would see addresses like this first one that start with IPv4 or whatever, whatever slash IPFS because this is this came from uh, before uh, when libp2p was actually bundled into IPFS. Now it's been extracted to IPFS, so we use the P2P um, uh, address format here. Um, the main reason we did this is like this first one can look like a file sometimes. Like if you see a slash IPFS slash Q or something, people say, "Oh, that's a file." No, it's not a file. It's actually an address of a node on the network. Uh, so we want to disambiguate that. Um, okay, uh, gateway. We made a couple of improvements to the gateway here. A big one was subframe gateways. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much because Lytle is going to give a presentation on this pretty soon, um, but it's really cool and you should pay attention to that uh, presentation. This is actually really, really big for uh, dApps. Um, second of all, uh, a small uh, directory listening refresh. I'm just excited about this because like, it looks a lot nicer now. Um, it, now, if you list a directory through the FS gateway, Get this nice little uh, screen here with a nice header. That, yeah, but it just looks better. Um, IPNS. We've made a couple improvements to IPNS. We're still going to have to make a lot of improvements in the next releases. Um, uh, and we're also going to need to stabilize some of these features, uh, but more features on the way. Uh, first up, transparent ENS. Um, uh, you can see up here uh, that I have ipfs.eth.ipns.localhost. Uh, uh, normally, this uh, previously, this would have to be ipns.eth.link. Dot IPNS dot local host. Um, uh, but the, the cool part here is now is basically with, with IPFS, you can resolve slash IPNS slash something dot ETH without having to tack on the extra dot link. So it, just, it looks more native. Um, if you want this to be truly native, you'll have to install a, uh, an ENS resolver locally on your computer and set that as your DNS resolver. But IPFS does not provide that out of the box because they're required like ingesting the entire Ethereum blockchain at the moment, which is not something you can do. Uh, second up, uh, base32 IPNS. Most people will, here probably won't care too much about this. There are some people here who care a lot about this. Um, you can now encode IPNS uh, addresses in base32 uh, using CIDs. Um, uh, improved IPNS for pubs up, or in other words, make IPNS faster. Um, uh, this is still experimental. It's going to be stabilized on the pub sub in 0.6. Uh, but uh, basically, what the, so normally when you're trying to resolve an IPNS address, uh, you have to search the DHT, which is slow, um, and it's faster, but it's still not as fast as it could be. Um, but so, uh, the IPNS of a pub sub, what you do is like you find peer, other peers that are interested in the same IPNS key, and then you subscribe to updates this IPNS key from those other peers. Um, this uh, the improvement here allows you to actually like proactively go and fetch these updates from other peers when we first find them. So before, what we'd have to do is like subscribe to the updates, but we still have to search the DHC for the initial value. Now we can find other peers that are in the topic and just ask them directly, hey, what's the latest value? That means that like, um, especially if you're already connected to some of these peers, which is often the case, if you're all interested in the same content, um, which is usually, usually the same as correlated, uh, you can just get these IPNS results really, really quickly. Uh, but again, you have to enable this. It's experimental. Um, OK, and a lot more. I'm probably over time now. Um, I, so. Yeah, you reduce badger memory usage, flat FS improvements, a ton of random stuff here that I'm not going to mention. Um, IPFS add has new ignore and no rules path flags. Uh, we've gotten rid of the IPFS repo FSCK command. Um, basically, you used to do a problem where you can see like this annoying error, API not running. They got rid of that. That's no longer a problem. Um, the API now only accepts post requests. This helps tighten some of our like, security around the API. Uh, the dark containers that built with openness to self by default, this should reduce CPU usage. Uh, unfortunately, the TLS transport does not use OpenSSL, so that'll actually increase CPU usage as they don't upgrades and we'll have to like implement the open or um, open SS support for the TLS transport. <laughs> That's another thing. Uh, improved TLS, uh, sorry, improved system D support. Uh, this is really important if you're um, using IPFS in a server somewhere. Uh, 
basically now IPS supports socket activation and system key notifications. So you can properly order other services after IPFS that you can wait for IPFS to start up. You can also set IPFS like restart automatically, um, a bunch of cool things and a bunch more as well. Uh, I'm not gonna get into most of this. You can now run IPFS pin ls dash stream uh, to stream like a list of pins instead of letting them buffer all in the server all at once. So before if you ran IPFS ls or pin ls, it was gonna sit there for a very long time. Then eventually spit out a bunch of data at you. Now it is continuously spit data at you. So it doesn't look like it's just frozen. Um, uh, oh, fun thing for Windows. If you double click on the IPFS exe on Windows now, it'll just initial, oh, one, it'll initialize your repo for you and then it'll start the data. Uh, so like now instead of like having to open a terminal and things like that, you can just double click the IPFS exe repo, or sorry, IPFS exe uh, binary and it'll just work. Um, that is pretty much everything that's important. Um, there are a ton of other things that were fixed. I am sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>